All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, lesson 80. You know, we've been talking a whole lot about kings, kings of Israel, kings of Judah, kings of the northern kingdom, <laughs> kings of the southern kingdom. But yet there seems to be one common thing, theme, which is really they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Every once in a while, you'd have some guys sprinkled in that, that do good. Now think about this, in 2 Kings 21, we're gonna teach on 2 Kings 22, but in order to give you a backdrop in 21, here you have Manasseh. Now Manasseh was, it says in 21.1, he was 12 years old when he became king, and just so you guys know, he was the most wicked of them all. What? And in fact, here's how bad it was. In verses 17 through 18, eventually, uh, <laughs> you know, Manasseh dies, right? And then he has a son, you ready for this one? Amon. And then the servants end up, guess what? Even killing Amon. Like his own people kill him. So like the dad is bad and the son is really bad. And it's just like, what? Could it get even worse? Well, praise the Lord, enter a new king. After Amon is dead, now we've gone from Hezekiah, Manasseh. Hezekiah was good, but then it got so kind of bad, really bad. His servants even killed him. Now you have enter Josiah. So Gen uh, Josiah enters in in verse 26 of 2 Kings 21. Kevin, if you go to verse 20, uh, 2 Kings 21, 26, it says he was buried in his tomb, right, in the garden of Uzzah, and his son, Josiah, became king in his place. So that, that just kind of, it seems how it happens. One dies, hey, he's now alive, regardless of his age, actually. In fact, if you go to 2 Kings 22, verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. So I mean, this guy is so mature compared to Joash. And Joash was seven years old when he was king. And now you have Josiah, who's eight years old. Now, 20 rulers of Judah. Now, this includes, let's, let's test Drew Gibbs here a little bit. Drew, do you remember the name of the queen? Uh, Athelia. Ath wow. This includes Athelia. So when we talk about the rulers of Judah, we're talking about Queen Athelia, the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab, right? Tries to kill everybody, wipe out any of these seeds, but of the 20 rulers, Kevin, how many you think are good? Eight. You cheated. No, he's smart. <laughs> oh, that was nice of you, Rich. Kevin, you are smart. All right, so here, here's who you have. I'm just gonna write, because it doesn't happen often. There's eight good rulers. Well, let's kind of run with a little bit about who Josiah is and what does it look like. It says this, it says he was eight years old when he became king. And he, was, he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, okay, Jedidah, the daughter of Adea. She was from Boscoth, okay? So Jedidah is the daughter of Adia. That's the mother, Jedidah, okay? I think this is important. We'll get to that maybe in a little bit here. Uh, in verse 2, it says, He did what was right in the Lord's sight. You guys, we don't get to read that often. And then it says he walked in the ways and all of the ways of, of his ancestor David. So he actually walked into the lineage of David. This is, what are we talking about? Here we go. We have a surviving seed. It's guys like this that carries. So, I mean, here are these eight good rulers, you guys. They're the ones that are pointing to the surviving seed. I mean, that's what we're after here. And it says he walked in the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn to the right or to the left. And so what we're going to get into, we're going to break up this section really into three things. And I love what Wearsby says, is one of the things that Josiah is going to do is that you're going to start seeing verses three through seven, repairing of the temple. Now what's interesting about this is, is that, uh, in the repairing of the temple, King Ahaz was the one who destroyed it. Remember this? He's bringing in all these things from Assyria. And so, oh, yeah, I love these false altars. And I love, oh, can you move that around a little bit? So now all of a sudden you have Josiah. He's coming in. He's coming to clean house. So the king, it says, he sent the court secretary, Shaphan, son of Azalea. I think that's how you would say it, right? Shaphan. Shaphan, son of Azalea, son of Meshulam, to the Lord's temple. And here's what he said. Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest. So Shaphan's going to Hilkiah. All right, we should probably write these names down. Shaphan is told to go to Hilkiah. And Hilkiah is, Kevin? He is the priest. High priest. Okay. Go up to Hilkiah the high priest so that he may total up the money and that is brought into the Lord's temple. The money the doorkeepers have collected from the people, the scripture continues on, 
It says, it is to be put into the hands of those doing the work. Those who oversee the Lord's temple, they in turn are to give it to the workmen in the Lord's temple to repair the damage. In verse 6, then it says they are to give it to the carpenters, the builders, the masons to buy timber and quarried stone to repair the temple. Scripture continues on, but no accounting is to be required from them for the money put into their hands since they work with integrity. I think this is a pretty cool picture here because here's what you're saying is, is that Shaphan then goes into the high priest and he says, hey, by the way, we trust you with the accounting of the money system. Like we trust you that you're going to give it to the right people. This is going to unfold. Like we don't have to monitor this. We actually believe you're going to do the work. Who is implementing the repairing of the temple? That'd be King Josiah. And you know, it says in the 18th year of King Josiah. So he's 26 years old when he decides, let's repair this, this temple. In verse eight, it continues on and it says this, Hilkiah, the high priest, he tells Shaphan, the court secretary, I found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. And he gave the book to Shaphan who read it. Okay, this really is, and I have one of these here, I'm just going to show you here, this, this book called Revive Us Again by Walt Kaiser. And, and what I love about this book is, is I mean, this is really one of those, I just kind of remember, um, kind of remember studying through this, and it's just kind of funny. I didn't even have this planned uh, in going here. But here you have what's called a revival under Josiah. I mean, this is exactly what's happening. You see a true revival. Why is a revival? Because not only are they repairing the temple, but they discovered the word of God again. It's like this word of God in a weird way, you guys, it, it, was, it had disappeared. Now, let me describe this, this book of the law. We'll describe Shaphan. We'll describe Hilkiah because there's, there's really coming about a true revival. Now, think about this, okay? The books of the law, it could imply parts or all of the Pentateuch. Okay, we're not sure completely if it's a little bit, but either way, there's a really good chance that it was placed by the side of the Ark of the Covenant. We don't know if it was lost. We don't know if it was just set aside. We don't know if it was hidden during the reigns of who? The two bad kings, Manasseh and Ammon. Like somebody could have hid it because they were afraid that it, it truly could have been destroyed. But either way, we, there, there's a good chance that Manasseh or Ammon, and Tom Constable says this, they destroyed existing co copies of Israel's covenant constitution, since there's every reason to believe that Hezekiah, Hezekiah knew the Mosaic law. Hezekiah knew it, but, you know, uh, Manasseh and Ammon didn't live like it, so they could have actually destroyed it or got rid of it. But we do know it wouldn't have been difficult back then in ancient times. There was probably just a few copies of even the official documents. Like there's not much. And I think there's, there's so much, there's beauty in this. When you find out the high priest says, hey, we have found the word of the Lord. And he gives it to Shaphan. And then Shaphan, it says, he began to actually, he began to read it. Now the question is, is what is he reading? Like what part is he reading? It says, uh, and this is really cool. Then in verse 10, Shaphan, the court secretary, he told the king, right? Um, Kevin, if you go to verse 10, yep. He told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. Kind of like, hey, I got a book here. You know, it's almost like the way he says it, it's almost flippant. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, I got a book here. And then Shaphan starts to read it in the presence of the king. We can't prove this. But there's a couple of theologians that would say maybe out of uh, the Pentateuch, this is what they could have read, just possibly. In Deuteronomy, if you look at the, if, what if he started reading the book of Deuteronomy? Again, all this is a, just a, a fun theory, okay? If you start reading chapters 4 through 13, what you're going to start reading is, and this could be Josiah hearing this for the very first time, maybe, is how wicked, um, how wicked the people are of the Israelites. Like how they have gone astray. And then maybe in chapters 14 through 18, uh, maybe they're starting to read out loud to Josiah all the things that they hadn't done that God was asking them. So here's the wickedness. Here's the things that maybe they're not doing. And then in chapters 27 through 30, if, if Shaphan is reading in front of King Josiah, a 26-year-old guy, and he's saying, hey, this is a warning because this is what God's going to do because all that you didn't do. Like if I'm King Josiah and I start hearing this, like, it could radically impact, oh, like, I, I probably should start changing everything. There's a good chance this is the first time he's ever heard the scriptures. You know, we, we go out and we interact with people all the time with the Word of God. We share the gospel. We open up the Word. And, you know, Rich, you've done this with me. And Drew, you've done this with me out on the streets as, you know, video camera guys. You know, how many times do we hear, 
I've never heard this before. I mean, over and over and over, you hear people say, I've, I, I've never heard this before. I, I've never read this before. And you're just thinking, what does that mean? Like we're in America, which is supposed to be a quote unquote Christian nation. And you're reading the scriptures in the 21st century. And they're like, I've never heard that before. Here's the question. When they hear the word of God, how do they respond? You know, there's a, a simple quote that Wearsby says. He says, how people respond to the word, it serves as an indicator of their spiritual hunger. There is something in King Josiah that when he heard, remember, scripture says, faith comes by what? Hearing the word of God. And Josiah heard the word. And he, he, it was this guy named Shaphan who was reading this. Crazy enough, it transitions into uh, the next verses. And it goes into, and I really should have done, I mean, they, they do a repairing of the temple. I'll just leave it at that right now. But then when you jump into verses 11 through 14, here's what Wearsby calls royal distress. <laughs> Because what happens is he starts to build the temple. As he's rebuilding the temple, they discover the word of the Lord. Right? Word of the Lord. That causes royal distress because it says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. That's why a lot of theologians said this process of Deuteronomy, they, he learned how wicked they were. He learned that they weren't doing anything. And then all of a sudden he hears what God's going to do to them. He, he tears his clothes. And then it says in verse 13, okay, uh, in verse 12, this is, this is what he does. In verse 12, he commanded Hilkiah, the, pri the priest, ah Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the court secretary, and the king's servant, Isaiah. So he has this five-man commission, okay? Five people, he then says, okay, guys, something radically has to change. Let me just say this. Shaphan's listed in here twice, okay? Shaphan, the court secretary, and then Ahikam, son of Shaphan. I just want to give you a little bit of backdrop, and I feel like Shaphan... Is uh, I mean, he's right here. He actually plays a really unique role. Uh, when you do a little bit of study, and again, I didn't know a whole lot about Shaphan. It's not like I have a daily devotional on this guy. But he had a remarkable family. He had a son named Gamaria. And he joined others in urging King Jehoram not to burn Jeremiah's scroll. Okay, so one of the sons said, hey, by the way, let's keep the word. Right, so that's kind of an interesting, this comes from uh, Shaphan. Then he had a grandson, Micaiah. He heard that Baruch read Jeremiah's second scroll in the temple, and then he reported it to the king's secretaries. So here you have a son and a grandson talking about the word of God. I mean, both of these guys, that's actually kind of refreshing, isn't it? So this is Shaphan's family. Shaphan has another son, Elisa, and his son carried Jeremiah's letter to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. So here you have Shaphan, actually his son, delivering the word to those that are in exile in Babylon. Okay, that's the second son. He's got a third son, Ahikam. Okay, Ahikam right here. Ahikam is among the men who consulted Huldah, the prophetess. Remember in 1 Kings 22 uh, and said, don't kill Jeremiah. So over and over again, it's kind of like they have these real encouraging words. It sounds like Jeremiah owes his whole life to this family. <laughs> Like, hey, don't kill him. Read his words. Hey, don't kill him. And then he has a grandson. Shaphan has another grandson, Gadaliah. Uh, he became the, the governor of Judah. So multiple family members. Well, that just leaves one son. He's got four sons. One son, I don't know if I'm going to say his name right, Jaazania, Jaazania, was a disappointment, and he worshipped idols in the temple. He would be considered the black sheep of Shaphan. You know, that's all I know is that three out of the four sons. But to me, when Wearsby describes Shaphan, it's like it's an incredible family lineage. And he is the one. And why? Because he's the one who got to read the book of the law for the first time, right? To, to King Josiah. So it, there's something like, hey, did you hear about my dad? He got to read this. Did you hear about grandpa? He got, like it got passed on and it actually stuck. Because a lot of times when you hear this lineage, it doesn't stick. And so here you have a court secretary, Shaphan, and his family understands, for the most part, with the exception of one son, like they want to embrace the Lord. And so five guys, right? King Josiah is told, go to these guys. And here's what I want you to do in verse 13. I want you to go and inquire the Lord for me, the people and all Judah about the instruction in this book that has been found. Like I need you. And I love this. I need some prophetic insight. 
Like I've heard this, but can somebody help me understand this from God's perspective? For great is the Lord's wrath that is kindled against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of this book in order to do everything written about us. So when I talk about why the theologians think maybe they're reading from Deuteronomy, this would be some of their support. Because they're saying, I, I just heard our ancestors, they're not obeying the word of the Lord. And now I'm stuck with this. What am I stuck with? Help me, please. And he says, go find some prophetic insight. And you know what that says to me? This shows Josiah is already humble. Like, this has nothing to do with my points here, but you have to just see in, in the distress, like, is there humility? And he asks for help. He begins to tremble, as some would even say, at the word of the Lord. So in verse 14, Hilkiah the priest, right? These five folks, Ahikam, Akbar, Shaphan, and Asaiah, they go to the prophetess Hulda, wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. That's just kind of a cool job. So they go to a prophetess. So you have prophets and prophetesses, male and female, and they go to a lady named Hulda. At the time of Hulda, I think this is really important to understand, it, so was Jeremiah and Zephaniah. You know how I told you how Shaphan's family is super connected with Jeremiah and they had a, such a great respect, keep the scrolls, don't kill him. I think it's absolutely bizarre. They don't go to Jeremiah, they don't go to Zephaniah, they go to a lady named Hulda. There's something about what Hulda represents and how she carries herself. She lives in the second district, the southern lower part of the city uh, topographically. I mean, like this is who she is. Now, some people, this is a theory again, is that she could be uh, the wife to Shalom who is related to Jeremiah. A lot of interesting, interesting connections. Again, can't prove any of this. I just like to help paint a picture about the family dynamics and, and how even maybe they'd be connected. So they go to Hulda. And so Hulda, Hulda, think about other women prophetesses. Can you guys name any? Can you guys think of any other women prophetesses that come to mind? Like in scripture. Moses' sister. Remember her name? Miriam. How about Deborah in Judges 4? Then you can go to, this is an interesting one, Nehemiah 6.14. Nehemiah 6.14. And the reason I want to show this is because is I think a lot of people think only men can serve as a prophet. Women clearly serve as a prophetess. And here you have Noadiah. It says, My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalot for what they have done. And also Noadiah the prophetess and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. Noadiah wasn't the greatest but she was a prophetess. I just want to show you these roles. Now think about this. Can you go to Isaiah 8, 3 for me, Kevin? Isaiah 8, 3. Uh, says, I was then intimate with the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son. You know, I wasn't really uh, going there with that whole scripture verse, but the reality is this is Isaiah's wife. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. So Isaiah had relations with a prophetess that happened to be his wife, okay? So my point is, is that here you have... Uh, hey, can you pronounce the name of the child that they had? Yeah, the name of the child is Mahir Shalah Hashbaz. <laughs> no, for real, it is. <laughs> How about Anna? Anna in Luke uh, 2.36. Here you have Anna the prophetess, Luke 2.36. Uh, there was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. One more, just to give you guys an example. In Acts 21, 8 through 9, you have Philip, and he has four daughters, and those daughters are all considered prophetesses. Uh, and so, did I say Philip? Yeah. yeah. So it says, We entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who is one of the seven, stayed with him. Verse 9 it says, This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So here you have Hulda. In humility, King Josiah comes and says, can you please tell me what does all this mean? Can you tell me everything that I'm hearing? And in verse 15, she said this. Th remember, she's talking to the five men, right? The five men are coming and she says, this is what the, the Lord God of Israel says. So we've gone from repairing of the temple. The word of the Lord shows up. He in royal distress, when he hears the word of the Lord, he then responds. And then here's what he asks for you guys. In verses 15 through 20, as weird as he says, you get prophetic Clarity. 
And she says, say to the man who sent you to me, so I want you to talk to King Josiah and here's what you're to say. This is what the Lord says. I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants. Oh, great encouraging word. Fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Scripture says in verse 17, because they've abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to provoke me with all of the work of their hands. My wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. Now, King Josiah doesn't know this yet. He hasn't heard these words, but the reality is, as, as Nelson says, the threat of calamity for apostasy, the things that the king heard, intended to reinforce the message of the part of the book of the law. So actually what she's saying is actually, yes, it sounds bad, but it's just reiterating already that this thing is true. Does that make sense? Because he said, and I, let me go back here because I think this is really important. Um, if this is true, what he read from Deuteronomy, but even if it wasn't Deuteronomy, I'm just kind of giving you an overview, okay? If the Israelites or people from Judah at some point they formed as in, in the area of wickedness, right? And then, that, and then he read also that he learned what people had not done, right? So if he heard these things and then he heard a warning in Scripture that Shaphan read, like God is going to do something. God would punish them. Like if this is what he heard for the very first time, and a prophet comes in and brings clarity, this should actually just affirm everything that he heard. Like it actually shouldn't be like, oh, well that stinks. I mean, that's, it does, but he's also like, hey, that, that's true. Like I actually heard if these things happen, X plus, X plus Y does equal Z. Like this is exactly what I heard. So, okay, so I'm just, I, I think sometimes we think, oh, that's a God of wrath, he's bringing it out, but God already said this is what's gonna happen if you did this. If you turned away from me, this is what's going to happen. But that bad news actually continues on. And it says in verse 17, because um, just, just real quick, why again? Because of all these things. They abandoned, they burned incense, they provoked me. My wrath is going to be kindled and it's not going to be put out. Now in verse 18, now I want you to say this as well. Say to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord of God Israel says. As for the words that you heard, okay, because your heart was tender. And you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you've torn your clothes and you wept before me, I myself have heard you. This is the Lord's declaration. Now just hold it for a second. I mean, this to me makes me think of Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah, you know, he drastically started crying out to the Lord. He heard he was going to die. He cries out to the Lord and God responds. Remember, Isaiah turns back and says, hey, I've already heard your prayer. God does the same thing with, with Josiah. He says, I've already heard everything you said. Yes, these things are going to happen, but let me, let me declare what I'm really saying to you. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your fathers and you'll be gathered to you, your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I'm bringing on this place. And then they reported to the king. So you have this bad news, right? And this bad news is what? That, by the way, your people are wicked, <laughs> I realize what you've done. And oh, by the way, God's going to punish you. But there's one good thing about this whole thing. Josiah, you're going to experience peace when you die. So where's the revival in this? When people talk about revival, they hear this story. Kevin, Rich, Drew, where, where do you think and why do people say, oh, this is a revival? You got any thoughts? I think it's a reprieve uh, that God can... I mean, the two kings right before Josiah have been... Awful. Awful. So Manasseh and Ammon, awful. And God says, I'm not going to... You're going to see peace until you die. So the revival is, you did what I've asked. You're going to get some blessing for it. Where did the revival come from? Josiah's heart. Josiah's heart. Okay. Rich, what else would you say? How else do you see revival in this? I, you're absolutely right, Kevin. And there's not one right or wrong answer. What would you say? Well, by virtue of the fact that they found the word and they just start, it was read, so at least now it's been presented to them. It's whether or not they want to live it out, I guess. So one of the characteristics you would say is just the word of God. Yes. Okay, good. Drew, you got anything else you want to add? Anything else that stands out about where do you see and how do you see revival? When people talk about 2 Kings 
22. They go here, and I'm just curious your perspective. I think um, kind of along the lines of what Rich said, they heard the word, but instead of just going, oh, that's nice, they kind of pursued it a little further. Hey, what does this mean? What does this actually mean for us? And then ran with it, I guess. Yeah, and I, I, absolutely. I, I think that they totally ran with it. And I think that's even where he asked for prophetic clarity. Yeah. So in, in that, can I just add a word? And I think you guys, we've heard this. We see the word humility, do we not? When he humbled himself and said, I need some help. And then, and then there was this, like he wanted to know more, didn't he? Like there was a hunger. He truly wanted to know more. Like, please, and in, in, my, in my opinion, when you have a heart condition that's humble and hunger, you're ripe for revival. And all of that has to be based on the Word of God. All of it. Because when there's humility and hunger, you're not looking to yourself, you're looking to Him, which is why I want us to go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Let's go to the, the New Testament because what happened is Shaphan, this godly man, this man who had a godly heritage, he then reads out loud. And when faith comes, faith comes by hearing the Word. This is why Scripture's here. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is inspired by God. And look at this, it's profitable for multiple things, okay? For teaching, so that you and I can learn what is this process, how do we get through life? For rebuking. There's times that we need to be called out and saying, you know what guys, we need to, we need to actually say, you know what, I'm, I'm wrong. Like, we're afraid to use the scripture sometimes this way. But like, when I go to scripture and I see certain things and I'd say, you know, you cannot be drunk, why? Because it says drunkenness is not of the Lord. Like, that's a lifestyle that doesn't reflect Christ. And you have to, at times, you have to rebuke people in this situation. But then there's other times it says Scripture is called for, for correcting. And so I think about Josiah. He's doing, it's all of this. <laughs> He's, there's teaching, there's rebuking, there's correcting. Like, whoa, wait, what? We need to come before the Lord and repent of our, of our, of our sins? Like, these are the kind of things, you guys, that Scripture's for. It is our bottom line. It is our foundation. It is our absolute standard. Why? so that we could be trained in righteousness, so that we could look like him. And in verse 17, it says, so that man of God, why? You and me, a man, a woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. When we have a humble heart that functions in humility and hunger, here's the best part. We can walk out the calling in our lives. Like every single one of us, I love when people are like, well, I don't know what I should do. Can I just tell you, here's a recipe for revival, truly. A humble heart leads to humility, which desires more and more. There's hunger. And he says, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you walk it out. In fact, Psalm 119, 105, it just says, the word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. You know what that means? It means that he's going to direct just the every day right now, but he's also going to show you like the bigger picture. And Josiah was getting both. The lamp to his feet and a light to his path. And he's like, you know what? We got to clean up some things. We haven't been doing it the way God wants us to do this. And that's what I love about the revival in 2 Kings 22. They found the Word of God and they wanted to know what God was saying. All right, guys, this is 2 Kings 21 and 22. Guess what? We get to talk about it some more tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>